Welcome to Hunt Harvest Health, the podcast with your host, Ryan Lampers, a.k.a. The Stealthy Hunter. Howdy. And myself, Dr. Hillary Lampers, where we share our love for ancestral living and the health topics of the modern age. Ryan is the well-rounded bearded brawn of Hunt Harvest Health. His knowledge of backcountry adventure, western hunting, and our household status as garden guru and super dad really defines our gut stealthy lifestyle. Doc Hillary is definitely the brains and beauty behind all of this. She kind of makes everything happen as I have zero technical skills. Hill is just a wealth of knowledge in all things medicine and nutrition, which not only keep our family healthy, but they help me stay strong in all my mountain adventures. You can follow us at huntharvesthealth.com, Instagram, and Facebook for more podcasts, recipes, and stories. All right, let's do this. Alzheimer's disease has become part of the zeitgeist. In news articles and blogs and podcasts on the radio and television and in films, both documentary and fictional, We read and hear story after story about Alzheimer's disease. Sadly, all end tragically. We fear Alzheimer's as we fear no other disease. There are at least two reasons for that. First, it is the only one, and let me repeat that, the only one of the nation's 10 most common causes of death for which there is no effective treatment. And by effective, I am setting the bar pretty low. If we had a drug or other intervention that made people with Alzheimer's disease even a little better, never mind curing the disease, I'd sing its praises to the rooftops. So would everyone who has a loved one with Alzheimer's, everyone at risk for Alzheimer's, and of course everyone who has already developed Alzheimer's. But no such drug exists. We don't even have a treatment to keep people with subjective cognitive impairment or mild cognitive impairment two conditions that often precede Alzheimer's disease, from going on to develop full-blown Alzheimer's. Incredibly, given the astounding progress in other areas of medicine over the last 20 years, think cancer or HIV AIDS or cystic fibrosis or cardiovascular disease. As I write this in 2017, not only is there no cure for Alzheimer's disease, there is not even anything that reliably prevents or slows Alzheimer's disease. You know how many, how critics make fun of TV afternoon specials and Lifetime movies about angelic children or saintly mothers and fathers who bravely battled cancer and with the aid of the latest miracle drug are restored to perfect health before the final credits roll? Smaltzy, sure. We in the Alzheimer's field would happily settle for Smaltzy if it were evenly remotely possible to depict a happy ending to this disease. The second reason Alzheimer's disease inspires such dread is because it's not only fatal. Lots of diseases are fatal. As the old joke has it, life is fatal. Alzheimer's is worse than fatal. For years and sometimes decades before, it opens the door to the grim reaper. Alzheimer's disease robs its victims of their humanity and terrorizes their families. Their memories, their capacity for thought, their ability to live full and independent lives, all gone in a grim and unrelenting descent into a mental abyss where they no longer know their loved ones, their past, the world, or themselves. No wonder we have come to fear Alzheimer's disease as omnipotent, as hopeless, as impervious to any and all treatments. Until now. Let me say this as clearly as I can. Alzheimer's disease can be prevented, and in many cases, its associated cognitive decline can be reversed. For that is precisely what my colleagues and I have shown in peer-reviewed studies in leading medical journals, studies that, for the first time, describe exactly this remarkable result in patients. Yes, I know it flouts decades of conventional wisdom to claim that cognitive decline can be reversed, that there are hundreds of patients who have done just that and that there are steps we can all take now to prevent the cognitive decline that experts have long believed to be unavoidable and irreversible. These are bold claims deserving of healthy skepticism. I expect you to exercise that skepticism as you read about the three decades of research in my lab, which culminated in the first reversal of cognitive decline in early Alzheimer's disease and its precursors, mild cognitive impairment and subjective cognitive impairment.
I expect you to exercise that skepticism as you read the stories of these patients, patients who climbed out of the abyss of cognitive decline. I expect you to exercise that skepticism as you read about the personalized therapeutic programs we developed to enable everyone to prevent cognitive impairment, and if they are already showing signs of it, to stop mental decline in its tracks and to restore their ability to remember, to think, and to once again live a cognitively healthy life. But if the results I describe overcome your skepticism, then please open your mind and consider changing your life. Not only if you have already begun the slide into cognitive decline, but even if you haven't. Needless to say, the people who will find this book most immediately and directly life-changing are those whose memory and cognition are already suffering, and their family members and caretakers. By following the protocol I described, those with cognitive impairment that is not yet Alzheimer's disease, as well as those who are already in the grip of Alzheimer's, can not only halt, but often actually reverse the cognitive decline they have already suffered. For those so stricken, progression to severe dementia has until now been inevitable. With nothing but bad news from every expert, the anti-Alzheimer's protocol my colleagues and I developed consigns that bleak dogma to the dustbin of history. This is an excerpt from Dr. Dale Bredesen and his book, The End of Alzheimer's, which he wrote in 2017. November is Alzheimer's Awareness Month, and I think that a lot of what he says here is so true that many of us may not even be thinking of Alzheimer's um, for our future, but perhaps we've experienced it in our family and personally, and uh, we we just kind of want to push it under the rug as something that we may we we may not experience in the future, or just don't even think about it. And the amazing thing about this book that Dr. Dale Bredesen wrote, and the research that he's done over the last twenty years, is showing that prevention is the key to. Um, well, preventing Alzheimer's and even reversing cognitive decline. He's also shown that Alzheimer's disease is not just one thing, as we've been taught to believe, like the plaques in the brain. He talks in this book about the three different types of Alzheimer's that he and his um, colleagues have basically panned out from their years of research. He also talks about ways to prevent it and the cognoscopy, which is basically baseline numbers um, and some images of your brain, but baseline numbers that are going to show us what your body is doing in real time in order to prevent uh, dementias, Alzheimer's disease, and cognitive decline in the future. He's basically saying um, you don't have to end up, we don't, Alzheimer's does not have to be a disease. It does not have to be feared. And that if we take care of ourselves um, and we do some of the, the, the prevention steps that he talks about. We know our numbers. We do the right diet, um, especially uh, if we know our genetics, that Alzheimer's is not something that you have to fear. And it's a really powerful book. So I thought, what a better time to talk about this than um, uh, November. Alzheimer's Awareness Month. So I sat down with a colleague of mine at Elevate Health that I work with in Montana, uh, Dr. Bronwyn Bacon. And we have both read this book and we have both worked on these parameters with patients. It's called the cognoscopy and that's what Dr. Dale Bredesen um, refers to. But really, if you read the book, which I hope you do, um, it is a, it's a great read, especially if you have any dementia or Alzheimer's disease in your family. Uh, and he, he talks about this cognoscopy as a way that we can all know our baseline numbers so that we can um, prevent this disease. And by using this cognoscopy with patients, especially patients who have any genetic risk or family history of Alzheimer's or dementias, or they're starting to notice sub subjective um, impairment, um, they're noticing their memory, having issues with their memory, their family members are noticing that, by implementing um, the prevention steps that the cognoscopy um, refers to, 
it's amazing what you can do um, to help the brain. So in this podcast, we're going to talk a lot about about a lot of different things. We're not going to obviously talk about everything in the book. But um, one of the things we didn't talk about was the diet uh, for um, the the Alzheimer's prevention diet. And he talks um, in the book quite a bit about it. And it's kind of the base of it. And we didn't talk about it just because it's a big subject, but it's, it's a keto flex diet. And so we have talked about keto before. I know it's a big thing, but, um, I just wanted to say we didn't touch on that just because of the the big subject it is. But I also discuss about why I wanted to do this podcast and what kind of led me to it recently to wanting to share it with our community. Um, Dr. Bacon is amazing. She's, She's so easy to talk to. She lives in Montana. She's an outdoorsman and a hunter. Um, Her and her husband are um, great people to work with. And I feel really fortunate to be here now doing this with them. And then um, us having this keen interest in in Dale Bredesen's work as well. So I hope you enjoy this. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody out there. Um, And we give great gratitude that you are still tuning in. I know it's been a while since I've put out a podcast. Guess what? Ryan is back. He got back from his last mule deer hunt this morning. So plan on hearing from him more. And uh, yeah, the podcast is about to pick up. Hunting season is is currently over until, hmm, I don't know if I ever truly believe that. (laughs) All right, everybody, you can find this plus the show notes, plus I also have the list of what is on the cognoscopy. If you wanted to take this to your doctor um, or read more about it, definitely go to our website there and uh, buy Dr. Bredesen's book. It is so worth it. And um, all right, have a great Thanksgiving. Enjoy. So today's podcast is, for me, very exciting. I've been waiting to kind of talk about this topic for a long time, um, partly because I have a huge interest in it. Um, And I I thought, well, who better to talk with than my colleague here at Elevate Health in Bozeman, Montana, which is where we moved to. Um, I was lucky enough to get a position here working... um, as a primary care naturopathic physician and also in the specialties that I do. Um, You can go to elevatehealthmt.com to learn about that. But the owner and founder of Elevate Health, Dr. Bronwyn Bacon, is here with me today to talk about a very serious subject um, that will affect all of us in our life, and that is brain health and long-term cognition. And so welcome. Uh, Should I call you Dr. Bacon or can I call you Bronwyn? You can call me Bronwyn. Okay. Uh, So Bronwyn, just share a little bit about yourself and your journey and um, help people understand and what you do here. Sure. Sounds great. I'm really, really excited to be here. It's going to be a fun, fun (laughs) conversation. It's also something I'm really passionate about. Um, So I'm a naturopathic physician as well. I uh, started out in Washington State, had a practice there for a couple years, and then really wanted more mentorship. So I had the opportunity to do a residency out here in Montana. So my husband and I packed up and moved out to Montana and did that residency and then had the opportunity to move to Bozeman and joined a clinic here. And then three years ago, uh, my husband, Devin Brewer, and I decided that we would open up our own practice. And so we founded Elevate Health and have been working on that for the past three years. And it's really exciting because we've had the awesome opportunity to have you join the team. And we also have Noelle Butler, who's another naturopathic physician. And so just been a lot of fun over the past several years building all of that. Um, My focus is predominantly in uh, family medicine. I do a lot of endocrinology, a lot of digestive health, a lot of um, work with people, just getting them eating well, living well, all the good old naturopathic stuff that we all love to do. Mm-hmm. And um, I feel like this this topic we're going to talk about tonight falls right smack dab in the middle of all that great stuff. Um, Yeah, so that's a little bit about what I do in practice. I um, love living in Montana. It's 
we really were attracted to come out here because of all the great outdoor stuff. And um, we love to hunt and hike and camp and all that great stuff. So, mm-hmm. um, and ski and the snow just arrived. So we'll be getting out and doing that soon too. And um, yeah. Yeah, there's almost no better place to live than here. I mean, I grew up here and it's changed quite a bit, but it's still such an amazing place. If you love the outdoors and you just love waking up every day and seeing the sunshine and looking at the mountains and um, doing all the outdoor activities, it's it's really just a heaven for that. Yeah, it doesn't get much better. When we moved here, I was a little nervous because I've always lived near the water, you know, grew up in the Northwest mm-hmm. and I guess we're still in the Northwest, but the Pacific Northwest and lived on an island and was like, what am I going to do without the ocean? And um, discovered quite happily that the rivers and the mountains are just as gorgeous. So yeah, it's pretty, pretty heavenly out here. Yeah, it's coming back here and I don't know, it's just a whole change, I think, in the way I feel because growing, you know, living in Washington for so many years and like right now you said it's snowing outside. Right. And I mean, for Washington, that would be crazy right now for us to be getting snow in <laughs> Seattle. Like people would be freaking out because it's only the beginning of November. But um, it's funny it, to me; it almost feels like a blanket. Like I just feel snuggled in, and I yeah. love it. And I so prefer it over the dark, wet rain. Um, and I think it's been a tremendous shift. It's helped me with my mood. And I mean, we're going to be talking about the brain today. And for me, I just think it's it's made a huge difference just in two months that I've been here and how I feel, like how my body feels and my ability to focus and the way I sleep at night. I mean, it's just so for me, I'm, I, I kind of knew that was a change that I needed, especially every time I came back here. I was like, I don't want to leave. <laughs> oh, that's so awesome to hear. Well, I think it's so the outdoors are so accessible here, you mm-hmm. know, it's like, even when it snows like this, I mean, even right in town, you can go cross country skiing or snowshoeing. And it just is so, we're so lucky to have such um, gorgeous landscape all around us and such great nature. And, and you can just go, I mean, when I lived in Seattle, one thing that always drove me crazy was it felt like a full day expedition to go do anything hike or anything Mm -hmm. let alone like getting really into nature Mm -hmm. and here I feel like you can make an afternoon trip where you just go fishing or hunting and you still have time to go to work in the afternoon (laughs) yeah it's like you could go ski for a half day and still work that day yeah definitely Uh, you know people say oh do you guys ski and you know uh, listeners out there you know that Ryan and I used to be big skiers but after having children fighting the traffic and having like a baby in a car seat crying and both of us couldn't ski anyways right we'd take turns and just the expense of it and the time it was just like it wasn't worth it anymore it wasn't worth it to drive almost two hours to the ski hill and then it could be even more than that on the way home right so I think here it's just a it's a nice change and we'll be able to to do those outdoor activities more so So accessible here it's great I know all right Enough, uh, mm-hmm. l- uh, enough goo eyeing over at Bozeman, Montana, but uh, <laughs> if you've been here, you know why we're doing it. Okay, well, just a little bit of background on why I wanted to do this podcast. Uh, well, my specialty is more in neurology, and so I've been doing that for years, and I've been working with patients who have chronic pain, headaches, previous uh, brain injury, and traumatic, uh, traumatic brain injury, and concussion. And so I've always been very intrigued by the brain in general. And I also did some training uh, with Dr. Daniel Amen. So I did his brain coaching oh, nice. stuff. And that was really just learning about really in depth with learning about the different parts of the brain and, and how they affect all aspects of our life. And then, you know, he uses the spec scans mm-hmm. to, um, in a lot of ways, it's pretty neat because he always said, you know, in psychiatry that... It was the only medical specialty that didn't actually look at the organ that they treated. Oh, interesting. Uh, That they were, you know, you would talk to somebody and then you would prescribe them a med. And if that didn't work, you would prescribe them another med. And you didn't really know how the brain was actually functioning. And we do know by biochemistry in general is not the same for everybody. And so one drug that works well for someone is not going to work well for another. So he started doing the spec scans on the brain and seeing 
how each person was being affected. And then also being able to appropriately diagnose conditions like ADHD, uh, PTSD, um, anger and aggression issues, even um, pain conditions and uh, addictions like alcohol and drug addictions and how they're affecting the brain. So that's always been very intriguing to me. I just find it fascinating that we... Well, for one thing, you know, the brain is so mysterious um, right. because really our brain is what makes us who we are. I, I mean, if you think about it in an organ sense, like sure. it, it creates our personality, it creates our mood. It even does things like creates our pain. You know, 100% mm -hmm. of pain, at least chronic pain, is in the brain. And I find that really interesting. Um, why do some people deal with pain better than others? Um, why do people, some people deal with anxiety better than others? Um, why do traumas affect some people? The same exact trauma will affect someone in a different way than it with someone else. And so I've had always had that keen interest in neurology and, and brain function. So I don't know, a couple months ago, I was listening. I listened to Dr. Rhonda Kirkpatrick's uh, Found My Fitness podcast. And she's obviously a PhD. She's a researcher. Her stuff is in depth and intense. And if you're a lay person, it's kind of overwhelming. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you listen to that. And if you don't understand science, well, it's, it's kind of like, whoa, that goes over my head. But, but I love it because, you know, you and I can geek out on that stuff. Sure. And so I listened to, she did a podcast with Dr. Dale Bredesen who wrote a book last year called The End of Alzheimer's. And I've referenced this book a few times on different podcasts. Um, I wrote a blog about kind of my family history and some experience that I've had, and I referenced that book as well. You can find that on the podcast, I mean, on the website. But I listened to her interview him. And a lot of it I had already learned through the book. And, and um, you know, I feel like a lot of what he's teaching is naturopathic principles. I yeah, mean, we, I would agree. We, we have been talking about these things with patients, which you and I will get into here in a little bit, forever. Yeah. You know, we've been talking about this, but medical doctors, um, especially when it comes to research and finding a cure, yeah. um, the things that you and I do are hard to translate across a large population sure. because, again, everybody's biochemistry is different. Right, right. And so trying to find a drug or a vaccine to fix this one condition, they're kind of going after just one thing. So I listened to um, her podcast with him. And then shortly after she was on Joe Rogan, again, she's on there frequently, and she was talking about it as well. But I felt that it would be cool to talk about some of this stuff, talk about cognitive decline, talk about brain health, not just as related to Alzheimer's, but just related to longevity in general. Sure. And kind of dumb it down for people who aren't scientists who don't understand these mechanisms and these you know the the biochemistry and the pathways and uh, dna and promoters and uh, sirtu and and right, a right. B and like all these things and so i thought it would be just cool to talk about can it make it so that people can understand why um approaching your brain health is as important as you know, um, <laughs> thinking about, you know, your mammography that you get and your colonoscopy that you get and your physical that you get and, you know, um, just all the things that we heavily promote in medicine as preventative things yeah. or diagnostic tools. We don't, again, like Dr. Amen said, you know, we don't look at this organ that we treat and we treat it a lot with medications and we just kind of wait and see what happens. So I thought it would be cool to just talk about some of these things. So yeah. that's really kind of the backstory of why I asked you to do this with me. Well, I think that's great. And I, um, you know, came across the book End of Alzheimer's and Dr. Brennison's work a while back and really was really impressed in the same way that one, it just is good naturopathic medicine and principles in what he's recommending that people do. But also, I feel like a lot of times you hear about cognitive decline as if it's just, well, you get old, you know, you start mm -hmm. to forget your keys and you start to forget to this and that. And, and suddenly you just don't remember things. And I feel like um, 
a lot of people look at their whole body that way. You know, regularly, I feel like I sit down with patients and they say, well, I'm old. That's why blank. Mm -hmm. And sure, as our bodies age, they change and, and things happen. But that said, there's a lot we can do to slow that decline. And there's a lot of things we can do to prevent it. I mean, we hear all the time about people that are in their 90s and are still living at home and driving their truck. And just I think that we chalk a lot up to age that is really relating to a lot of other factors. And he talks a lot about that. Mm -hmm. And I think we also look, you know, now that we understand so much about genetics and environmental factors and these other um, markers that we can check in the blood and all these things, we can actually, we can catch a lot of things a lot earlier mm -hmm. and we can do something about them instead of just waiting until things are really bad. Yeah. And I, I would say with the approach that we're going to talk about today and that the, the really, I would like to see it implemented in children. These things are an, emphasized in children because a lot of things that happen to us happen to us as children, yeah. meaning injuries, falls, um, poor diet. I mean, how, how often do you see patients? I mean, I do that didn't have good diets as kids oh, yeah. and they have, you know, they may not have like a classic developmental disorder, but they don't really have a good relationship with food and they have weight issues and diabetes and obsessive compulsive things and personality issues sure. and ADHD and all of this sometimes a lot of it is related to how they were taken care of meaning or what their parents could do for them or knew what to do as children and sometimes sure. kids are just they're just gonna fall they're gonna have injuries they're gonna be you know, risk takers. And so I think it's important that we um, really emphasize that, you know, it's not just something you should be doing because you're getting old. Right. It's, it's something a lifelong. You, should, you should be implementing with your children of course. as much as you can. Well, and, and teaching your children. Yeah. I, yeah. And I would, I would just add to that, that I'm always amazed at how many people have had head injuries or multiple head injuries and they don't think it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, I, I always ask as part of my uh, first visit about past injuries and always, almost always people say, no, I have no injuries. And then I say, what about concussions and, and head bonks? And lots of people say, yeah, so it's no big deal. Were you, did you, you know, when you hit your head, were you knocked unconscious? Well, yeah, but you know, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. And people just don't realize the, the repercussions, especially when they're um, having you know, multiple concussions. And so a lot, just along those lines, I feel like a lot of kids play football, they, mm -hmm. you know, rodeo, they do all these different activities and no one takes it serious that their little brain is getting shaken <laughs> and, and concussed, which is really has some serious implications when you're older. I mean, this could be a good segue into the actual genetics of sure. brain health and one of the big genetic factors that we know and um, Dr. Bredesen talks about this in his book is that uh, we there's a gene called the APOE gene and there's three different subtypes of it and there's a subtype that's that would we would consider more high risk than the other ones so there's two three and four APOE two three or four and if you have an APOE4, your risk of possible Alzheimer's disease or cardiovascular disease or longevity issues can be greatly um, increased. So just to, just to come back a little bit, um, the brain needs to be cleaned out, right? Mm -hmm. and, and APOE is basically a lipoprotein that carries fat. And... Um, it's interesting when you look back in history is that back in the very beginning, everybody on the planet had a 4-4. And what that means is that you get, you know, in genetics, you get one set from mom and you get one set from dad. But APO 4-4, meaning you got one from mom and one from dad, was the only um, combination. And the reason they figure for that is because it was very important to be able to fight infection and to create an inflammatory response to your external environment because that is what protected you. And like if you stepped on a nail or a rusty, you know, something or 
you know, you were attacked by a tiger or whatever it was, is that your body was able to create an inflammatory process to decrease exposures to either viruses or bacteria and to help you fight it. So it was good in the short term. But what they found in the long term is that APOE4 is not good in the long term because it actually creates more a more inflammatory process because it can't clear the brain out. Like it can't detoxify the brain um, and then it creates the plaques. And a lot of people, when they hear of Alzheimer's disease, they've heard of the plaques. And the plaques build up in the brain and this is where most of the research the money goes towards, right? right? It right. goes to trying to figure out how we get rid of the plaques. Um, and we like to just not have those plaques happen in the first place. <laughs> exactly. And what's interesting is when you look at that, Dr. Bredesen states that what he found is those are not bad. Those plaques are not actually there because something is it, they're not like bad. No, they're, they're there to protect your brain. They're there because there's an inflammatory process going on, either where your brain cannot eliminate and detoxify. And so what it does is it creates plaques to protect your brain. It's trying to protect it. But over time, obviously getting plaques in your brain is detrimental. And so I'm guessing a long time ago that people weren't living to the ages that they are now. And so in the short term, having that inflammatory response and being able to fight off viruses and bacteria was really great for you. And maybe you weren't living to be even 50 years old. I so, also really wonder if we just didn't have as much assault on our body. I mean, we, we did because there was infection and there were those types of things, but we didn't have these like environmental contaminants. People weren't getting diabetes. People, you know, like there's, there's yeah. things now that I think have much more severe repercussions on those plaque formations than... For the long term. Yeah, for the long yeah. term. So I think, I, I just would wonder if even if people lived longer, if they did live into their 60s or 70s or whatever, mm -hmm. um, if there wasn't as much problem with those plaques because I mean I don't know that it's just a guess but well the interesting thing too is is that you know not to get too heavy into the biochemistry of it but that APOE4 it can bind to what's called the SIR2 and SIR2-1 and and that is something you don't want it it it, it can bind to it and inhibit its activity SIR2-1 is actually it's kind of a longevity thing so the more you have of it the younger you are right right that the maybe everything about you is, is working at a younger place. If you're binding that up and you're not, you're blocking it, you're not getting enough SIR2-1. So you're actually aging. And that's mm -hmm. another process of the plaques. You're getting this aging thing. Is getting back to the genetics of it. If you have a child who is, and when we talk about head traumas, which is so common. Right. I mean, I've dealt with head traumas in my practice for over 10 years and was exposed to this stuff for 20 years. And I've had head traumas myself and I've had concussions, sports concussions, and I understand the repercussions and the long right. like healing process of these things is that when you have an APOE4, it's going to take you a lot longer to heal from these. And that is an actual risk factor for having cognitive decline and or Alzheimer's right, in the right. future, yeah. right? So if you have a child um, who's doing repetitive sports like football, soccer, um, I know they've changed a lot of these sports to try to make it better. They understand now that head trauma is not good for children for sure and not even adults. But this is the whole, th this is the whole thing of the genetic piece of it is that if I knew my child had an APOE4 or had two APOE4s, there is no way I would let that child play a sport like football. Right. Or you soccer. Know, agreed. Or gymnastics. Or right. anything where they are going to land on their head repeatedly because you're just setting them up for that um, inflammatory process in the brain. I like to tell patients, because I test for this all the time, and I like to tell patients, you know, in this genetic lineup... <laughs> If, if they have an APOE4, mm -hmm. I like to just say, you know, you just have to take, you have to be more careful than the next person who doesn't have this. Mm -hmm. And that's just, you know, we all draw the short straw sometimes. And yeah. 
this is it for, you know, and, and then there's probably some advantages with having, having an APOE4. You know, there may be things, you know, I don't know about modern life if it ends up panning out that way. But, um, yeah, you just have to take care of yourself better. Yeah, and and there's only, you know, there's 75 million Americans walking around with one APOE4. There's about 9 million Americans walking around with two. Um and the most common allele is a three. Right. So as our DNA changed and as we changed over time, we started creating new alleles and we got three and then we got two. So new, two is actually protective. So if you have one, two or two twos, it could possibly be more protective for you. However, it doesn't necessarily rule out that you're going to get Alzheimer's. And the reason for that now is because well, let me go back. They've called the APOE4 the Alzheimer's gene, right? Right. It used to be if you've had a 23andMe done or you've done a genetic test, when you go in to get your results, there's like six boxes you have to check that you swear you want to know this information. You're sure you want to know this information. If you find this information out, you're going to be okay because it's been, it's been correlated to a higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And so when you check all those boxes and you say, yes, I want to know, and an APOE4 shows up that you have one or maybe you have two, and then they give you a percent chance of what of, of getting Alzheimer's, is that's kind of a scary deal for a lot of people. Sure. Most people, it comes up with a three or a three, and two is a smaller percent yeah, of the population. Yeah, two is really rare. But it's not something that, again, I, I feel like, and, and what we're going to address here is, and what Dr. Bredesen addresses in his book is that that's not a death sentence because even a 2-2, even somebody with a 2-3 or 3 can still develop Alzheimer's. And what we're looking for is we're looking at these different, we're looking for all the different lifestyle factors that play into the process in the brain and how it's affected. So if you do have an APOE4 or you have any family history of Alzheimer's or dementia yeah. or cognitive decline, you should be tested. And the reason you should be tested is because it will help you to make better choices for your future. Well, there's so much you can do. There's so, so much, much you can do. And I really, you know, anytime I test this in a patient, I have a long conversation with them, similar to those check boxes where I'm mm -hmm. saying, are you comfortable knowing this information? This is what it could mean. And I always look at it with them and I, you know, I've seen a lot of people with APOE4s and a, and a handful that have two copies even. And I just say, this is great news because we can do something about it rather than we need to look at this as doom and gloom. This is now we know a little bit more about your body that we wouldn't have known before. And we know that we need to look at X, Y, and Z to protect you and, you know, help your body be healthier longer. Yeah, I th I just love that explanation, and it it takes um, it takes a lot of the fear out. Yeah, because in the past we've based this whole genetic, it's a, like a strictly genetic to have this information now for patients. Because it is. ten years ago, we probably wouldn't have been telling them the same thing just based on medical research, right? Right. Now as naturopaths, we would have said, okay, let's get on this, let's get busy. But right. now we're actually starting to show that your lifestyle and the choices you make and the things you have going on and you're exposed to have a huge impact on these genes. Totally. So, okay, so there's APOE4, just to break it down for you. And I know a lot of folks with APOE4. As do I, yeah. And they're all super smart, super smart, <laughs> intelligent people. It's true. I feel like it's the genius gene. Uh, the APOE4. So maybe in our early lives, we get all this geniusness and then our body just <laughs> says, dude, time to chill out and quit worrying about all this stuff. But um, I know a lot of very intelligent people with this gene. And um, so this is why using that intelligence and creating a healthier lifestyle is, is uh, you know, that's a, that's a cool piece of it. So, Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You want to talk a little bit? So Alzheimer's in general, or cognitive decline, we just say cognitive decline. So yeah, yeah. What's it doesn't the have to be perfect Alzheimer's. scenario for somebody to set themselves into cognitive decline? Hmm, let's see. Perfect scenario. Smoke a lot of cigarettes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Eat fast food. Uh, don't sleep. Sleep as little as possible. Um, I mean, you could throw some other drugs in there, other recreational drugs probably. That would help. Yeah. Um, hit your head. for sleep. Yep. 
take, take some medications. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously not all medications are going to lead there, but, um, yeah, don't, don't worry about eating your vegetables. Just focus on eating processed foods. Um, don't get any exercise. Those are some great places to start. Right. Uh, sit and watch TV all day. Yep. Sit around. Yeah. Have a lot of stress. Have a high oh, stress Oh, lots of stress. Job. And then make sure your mouth is full of mercury amalgams. Yep. And that you have toxic exposures at work and at home. On a regular like basis. Mold, yep. Which most people do. <laughs> well, at least in the Pacific Northwest, mold was a big deal. Gosh, even here too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It, yeah. It happens a lot all over the place. So, um, and then have a few drinks of alcohol every night just to yep. calm down. Eat lots of sugar out. and carbs. Mm. Yeah, can't forget the sugar, which yeah. I think most of us are eating, what, um, a bag of sugar a day. Halloween yeah. just finished. Oh, um, gosh. Let, so let me tell you, when you're a parent and Halloween comes, <laughs> you can f- you can physically and emotionally understand what sugar does to children. Yeah. Literally makes them addicts. It makes them crazy. And I, I mean, people can do what they want. I'm all about a libertarian society. If you want to kill yourself with sugar... Go for it. But there's some things that are just overdoing sugar um, is so detrimental to the brain. It really is. And, it's so detrimental it's to the whole body. <laughs> it is a hard one. Yeah. Uh, it's so hard. <laughs> Everybody. You know, when I tell people to minimize or get off of sugar, they're like, oh, yeah, that there's no problem. I, I, can, I mean, that'll be hard, but I can do that. And then they come in, you know, for their follow-up, and they're like, did you know that there's sugar in my, I don't know, chicken stock? Ketchup? Everything. 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 Salad dressing, bread. I mean, everything, everything. Your table salt has dextrose added to it, which is a sugar. Mm-hmm. I mean, everything. Everything has sugar in it. We are constantly eating sugar, even if we don't think it. Even if we're like, I don't eat sweets. Yeah. Read all the ingredients in your cupboard. You are eating tons of sugar. And you're eating tons of modified sugar like high fructose corn syrup, which is, you know, even more potent than just I was at old- Costco, <laughs> which is always interesting because Costco has some amazing things, organic, and you can get them for a great price. And then some things are like, okay. So I'm trying to find these fruit snacks my kids like. And it says, no high fructose corn syrup. And I read the ingredients. And the very first ingredient is corn syrup. <laughs> it's not high fructose corn syrup, but it's corn syrup. And I think, what? That is a, such a lying of advertising that's going on. It's horrible. So if you're not reading labels, like sometimes I buy my kids these things. Okay, once in a while you can have it. It's not the end of the world. But I mean, it's like if you're not reading that label and you're believing what those people say on the front, um, wow. <laughs> you're eating a lot of sugar or so you're not much. eating high fructose, but you're eating corn syrup. Or there'll be even be times when it's, you know, really emphasis, in, emphasis on how natural whatever it is, mm-hmm. is. And I'll look at the carbs and I'm like one serving, which is like the size of, I don't know, like a quarter, some piece of like chocolate or something. And then it's got like 40 grams of carbohydrates. And like, I mean, I'm probably over no i mean exaggerating a little bit but it can be so or you look at like fruit like juices and and things like that and it's something like it'll say something like i don't know 35 grams of carbs and so much of that is from sugar and then it'll be like three servings in one bottle i mean a child is drinking that entire bottle Mm -hmm. so i think that it's it's unreal how much sugar we consume well, last night my daughter was like, so mom, are you going to make me throw away the rest of my candy? <laughs> I, I just, I said, okay, so here's the deal. Do you get candy every day normally? No. I said, do I let you have a soda every day? No. Okay, so me letting you have candy every day, I'm letting, that's like me giving you a soda every day. And she's like, oh, because she's made soda is like unhealthy, right? right? It's not good for you. And when we go out or something, once in a while, she gets like a soda. She gets like a seven up or a root beer. Right. But I said, that would be like me giving you a soda every single day. You can just have a soda. Now, I don't mean that to sound like I'm arrogant because a whole heck of a lot of people drink soda. Yeah. Like, and they're drinking sugar-free soda that's like toxic to oh, your yeah. nervous system. If you want to talk about the brain and nervous system, aspartame, like, I'd rather have you drink sugar than aspartame. So yeah, I guess if there's a lesser of two evils. But, um, yeah, so she kind of went, oh, okay, like, I get it. You know, mm-hmm. the candy 
isn't that good for me. Right. And, and so sometimes it's uh, it's getting that across. But it's hard. And children have a lot of sweet taste buds. And we develop that in them for sure, right? So sure. it, it's harder when they're younger. Well, and they're seeing that in all of their friends. And there's all, I mean, I feel like childhood is so about events, you know? There's mm-hmm. like everybody's having a birthday and there's cupcakes for the birthday and there's like I mean there's just so many things that are exciting for kids and food and treats always get thrown in the mix which is a nice thing to do but also I think can get a little over the top yeah it can be hard yeah so um that's a perfect setup and I would say a good minority of the population is doing that Every yeah, day, right? I would agree. Yeah. So the statistics show that what, like third of the population is going to have Alzheimer's by, you know, in 25, 30 years. Because sure. we're all aging. Right. We're all living longer lives. Um, and if you look at the population as a whole, what we're doing, what we're eating, what our stress level is, how much we're sleeping, it's like a no brainer. Right. It's like we're just driving ourselves into cognitive decline. Right. And well, and you look at. I mean, even just beyond Alzheimer's, there's so many other things that can cause dementia and Mm -hmm. cognitive issues. So it's going to be even larger numbers than that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, um, it will kind of go back to Alzheimer's a little bit, just because people associate that. But I'd like to remind everybody to think about just your long-term brain health and your cognition, which means your memory and how fast it's working and everything that goes along with brain function is mixed in here. Um, But he defines three different types. He can pretty much, in his research, um, he has defined three, actually four, very specific types of Alzheimer's or cognitive decline. And so maybe we talk about that a little bit. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, You want to share the first one? Sure. Well... I'm going to share my favorite. Well, yeah, share your favorite. My favorite is the diabetes blood sugar issue Mm -hmm. type. And the reason that's my favorite or my least favorite, however you want to look at it, is that one, I do a lot of weight loss in my practice. And so often people are starting to have blood sugar issues. And that's part of why they're having a hard time losing weight. And, you know, I think, and to just loop it back to what we've been talking about, you know, sugar is so toxic in the bloodstream. And and what it's supposed to be is a fuel for our cells. We're supposed to be able to eat sugar, carbohydrates, and other things that turn into sugar. It gets turned into uh, a simple sugar in the, you know, in the bloodstream. And then it's supposed to go into our cells and we can use it as fuel. And the way that that happens is our pancreas produces insulin and insulin is the key that unlocks the door to get the sugar into the cell. And when we have too much sugar coursing through our blood vessels over a longer period of time, um, the lock, so to speak, on our cells gets gummed up and that insulin doesn't open the door and then we can't get the sugar into the cells and then the sugar just stays in the bloodstream and is super destructive and creates all kinds of inflammation, irritation, um, and literally will destroy blood vessels, which is why we see um, diabetics losing limbs, getting neuropathy, all of that is from damage to the blood vessels. And so um, we see that in the brain as well. We see um, that blood sugar being constantly elevated, causing some really serious damage to the brain and encouraging those plaques to form and uh, leading to cognitive decline and leading to potentially Alzheimer's. And so I'd say that one is my favorite slash least favorite because I I feel like I run into it so much. I run into so many blood sugar issues, and I one of the first things I worry about is the brain. I know the people sitting in front of me are worrying about their waistline, which is important too, but I'm worried about their brain. Yeah, I, when we know diabetes is uh, definitely an epidemic worldwide, actually, and so this is a great way. I mean, your scenario that you gave, almost everything there is going to mess with blood sugar and right. insulin um, and stress hormones like yep. cortisol and et cetera. We're going to see a change in blood sugar. Yep. I mean, cortisol is a stress hormone, but it's a blood sugar hormone as well. Right. right? So stress can initiate this as, too. And I see elevated insulin and blood sugars in people who are thin. Oh, all the time. Yep. All the time. And I see the, the, something that was a big eye opener for me is I always used to check, you know, I was 
brand new into practice and I thought, well, you check a fasting blood sugar and then you know if someone has blood sugar issues. And then I started researching more and I, I learned, okay, you, you check a hemoglobin A1C and then you see even better if they have blood sugar issues. And what I've found over the years is that if you're not checking fasting insulin, you're going to miss so, I mean, and other markers, but you so often can miss issues because they'll start having spikes in insulin and maybe their blood sugar looks great still. Mm-hmm. And it, and that those spikes in insulin are going to c- continue for you know, a period of time, and then they'll start to have blood sugar issues. But you can catch things so much earlier, and I just see it all the time. Yeah, and when it comes to brain injury, when it comes to traumatic brain injury, when it comes to traumatic injury, like mm-hmm. um, like emotional traumatic injury, such as PTSD or mm-hmm. whatever, again, you have to ADHD, you have to take into consideration how these blood sugar fluctuations, as well as insulin, are affecting these conditions. Of course. So how common is it to have an ADHD kid and have his diet radically changed if his parents can do it and if the child will do it and have their ADHD be changed dramatically? So, yeah. so common. And um, even, you know, PTSD is a big one. A lot of people suffer from PTSD and then they get put on medications and then they get counseling and then they go into the system and they don't really get the help that they need, and nobody is monitoring their lifestyle. Right, Nobody's right. looking at how much sugar they're eating, how much alcohol they're drinking, the medication mixes that they're on, um, how much exercise they're getting, and so this is just going to enhance the um, these PTSD symptoms. Well, and I think it's such a catch-22 because so many people self-medicate with food and alcohol mm-hmm. and other substances uh, to get, you know, catecholamine boosts and things like that because they're already suffering from, you know, emotional trauma and physical trauma that's led to those levels dropping. Mm-hmm. And it just becomes this kind of sick cycle where they're needing those foods or needing those substances to feel better. It doesn't keep them feeling better that long. And then it's just feeding the fire of this inflammation and destruction. You know, I am always amazed at how many people I talk to that um, they self-medicate. They're not even drinking heavily, but they feel normal when they have a drink or two. Mm -hmm. And they know it's so interesting because you can even have it to where they don't have maybe the addictive personality piece. You know, they don't have some of the genetics that are leading to them having more addiction. And they're saying, well, I know it's not good for me to drink two drinks. And so... I stopped for a while and for like three months I didn't drink two drinks, but I felt horrible for those three months. And it's, it's not even, I mean, so often it can just bring people to baseline. Mm -hmm. And I think that can, that's so hard, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about another type. Uh, Probably one that's super common. I I do think one thing we should say real quick is we do know things to do about all of this. Exactly. (laughs) We're sounding so doom and gloom. (laughs) You don't have to suffer for the rest yep, of your life. This and is true. Yes. No, that's the whole point of this podcast mm-hmm. is we want here. We're in a little bit here. We're going to actually give you some, hopefully some things to take yeah. away from this. So type two, next type. Next type would be the inflammatory type. Yeah. Such a common one yeah. as well. And this is obviously more common in people that have APO, have an APOE4. Right. Um, again, because of the mechanism of APOE4 and what it's doing, it's causing more inflammatory reaction right. as a protective mechanism. But if you have a lot of inflammatory things in your lifestyle, it's going to exacerbate this. So if you do know your genetics and you have it, you know, there are markers for inflammation that you really want to stay on top of. Um, and I think we hear the word inflammation a lot. Right. It gets it's just kind thrown of like, a lot around. Oh, totally. People don't understand it really what that means. Agreed. But there are some certain markers that we can look for yep. when we suspect that somebody's having inflammation. Right, right. Um, and like the one you were talking about, I think he calls it the cold version. Yeah, the cold yeah. version. Mm-hmm. And then there's a type that's both together. Right, right. Inflammatory and um, metabolic or cold. Right. And that is, I would guess, a very common one as well. Yeah, I would think so too. And I won't definitely, definitely because I wanted to make this everybody to understand it. We won't get into the biochemistry of that. Sure. But inflammation is very common. Um, we have a lot of inflammatory, just like the metabolic ones, we have a lot of inflammatory things going on in our life. And so 
Um, if you've been to the doctor and they've looked at things like your albumin and your liver, they've looked at um, maybe CRP. That's a common one now we're starting to look more at. Mm-hmm. Um, they're looking for these markers in your blood. Homocysteine is another good one. Homocysteine. Um uh, albumin, globulin, those Fibrinogen. Yep. But there may be some ones that they're not testing for. And sure. you can't really, you can't really count them out. Like the necrosis factor. Yep. Um, and then along with that insulin resistance, what we talked about. Of course. Well, and I find in. people come into me with labs and, or I'll run labs and I'll say, okay, well, we checked this inflammatory marker and it was it was not elevated. And the person will be like, oh, great. I don't have inflammation, Mm -hmm. but I don't understand. How come I have ulcerative colitis? And it's like, well, you do have inflammation, but this marker is inflammation in your arteries and you don't have inflammation that we're seeing with this marker going up, but you do have inflammation in your Mm -hmm. bowels. And so I do think that's another important distinction is that inflammation can be throughout the body. It can also be in specific parts of the body. I do feel it's too like there's very certain lifestyle things that I could tell people like you pretty much have inflammation. Oh yeah. If you smoke cigarettes, you have inflammation (laughs) Yeah, Um, because by nature it's destroying the vascular wall. Yeah. And it's, and I think people get caught, we get caught up a lot in cholesterol, but we know what cholesterol does. Cholesterols and these lipoproteins and all these things we're talking about. I mean, APOE4 is one of these one of these things we're talking about, their job is to heal things up, to transport fats out of your, into your body and out of your body. And if they're traveling through the vessel and there's these big gaping wounds in the vessel because they're all inflamed from tobacco smoke and not enough antioxidants and, you know, the list goes on, metabolic syndrome, the, the cholesterol is going to just try to plug up those holes. Yeah, I like to say it's an innocent bystander. Yeah, <laughs> It's exactly. like they're trying to fix things and then it gets all the rap for being the bad the bad guy yeah and so we even call it bad (laughs) cholesterol we do (laughs) i call it now because we can break it down into even smaller fractions right i call it the ping pong balls or i call it the big beach balls or the uh um the velcro balls oh i love it right because the velcro balls are small hard and they got velcro on them so anything they see they can stick to they stick to it that's it's like there's like a dart game you can do that right yeah yeah thing that's funny. I call We're, it the vehicles. Like I say, you have you want buses, not Fiats, because they can park perfect. easily. Yes, <laughs> I like the Velcro though. That's yeah. a good one. So those those little like <laughs> those little balls are going to plug up the hole. Yeah. Whereas the big beach balls, you can have big beach ball LDLs, and you can have little Velcro ball LDLs, and those big beach balls are just going to bounce down the vessel. Right. They're not going to plug up a hole. So it's important to have that cholesterol looked at in a very detailed way which yep. we which we can do yeah and there's um, lots of great labs that can do that yeah but again if you smoke or if you're drinking excessively or if you're not sleeping or you're taking a lot of medications it's likely you have inflammation yeah um, agreed. or if you have autoimmune disease or there's a mm-hmm. lot of different things So, okay, and then the last type which I think is actually the scariest type I would agree this one yeah. freaks me out yeah um, not that they don't all freak me out, <laughs> but I feel more, I feel like this last one is the harder one to treat. It's the more aggressive one. And it's the one that comes on when you're younger. Yeah. It's, it's, and it's more common in type threes, which is interesting. Yeah. So it's the really first two we talked about are more common. In, you could see it more if you have an APOE four, but majority of the population is an APO three. Right. I feel like that. Just pull it down. And oh, really good hold call. It. I like yeah. it microphone issues um, <laughs> they're not so bad but this one <clears throat> is in younger folks who are apoe3 yep and that's the majority of the population right right and this one is called toxic yep and i feel like those are the people that you're like oh you don't have the four all good right <laughs> you know you're and fine then, right right mm-hmm. but these are the ones that i think are going to have a mouthful of mercury or worked as a chemist or worked in the mines or is an artist or, you know, just working with something toxic for long periods yeah, of time. Painters. Yep. Yeah. Um, house painters. Uh, I think one of the only ways to actually like properly diagnose this is to look at heavy metals, to look at toxic and exposures. Right. Obviously, if you're taking a history, which is where we get 85% of our knowledge from a patient, what are you exposed to? We're going to look at that. Right. But, um, 
they can actually do brain scans and see some of the toxic elements. Mm-hmm. If you're having early stage cognitive issues and um, you're a type three and you're young, right? Early right. stage. Right, yeah. You're like, what? What's going on? Um, and so this is something to think about. And unfortunately, a lot of us have toxic exposures and we're not working a toxic job. Well, we I have to don't say... don't think we're working a toxic job. I had, so my sister has a little baby. She's a little over a year. And um, my sister's an artist. And so she was doing this project. She's a big art show coming up. And I was talking to her. And I said, oh, you and Mia should do some finger painting together. You know, it sounds like a very simple, innocent, fun thing to do with her toddler. And she said, you yeah, know, I'm, I'm not ready for that because she's going to eat the paint. And I did a little bit of research and it's all got pigments in it and realized that, you know, there's all these products out there. And then she said, gosh, don't even get me started about crayons. I was like, crayons. And she said, there's all these products out there. They're marketed as safe and natural and not having anything toxic in them. And they have all kinds. She said, there's crayons with asbestos in them. I mean, I was sitting there going like, wait a minute, I'm the naturopathic doctor. (laughs) And she's a librarian, so she knows a lot too. But oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just, I, it's like there's things that we don't even think about that seem totally safe. Or how about we eat everything out of plastic? I mean, you know. Well, how about ladies? I have oh, makeup. probably beat Ugh. this to death on this podcast, especially when we've talked about toxic and exposure for even men, like getting exposed to excess estrogens, you know, makeup, body products. So red lipstick has lead in it. And there's these lipsticks now that you can, so I had to buy them, I had to get one for, they told me I had to get one for my daughter's dance recital, where you put the red lipstick on and it does not come off. And then you have to buy this stuff that takes it off. It's like another lip gloss and it's an eraser. (laughs) So if you get like red lipstick above their lip, you can erase it. Oh my god. And goodness. I've done research and if you go to the environmental working group, yeah. a lot of those red and those stay on lipsticks, they are full of heavy metals. And how so scary. how much of a better place to put heavy metals than right on your mouth where you can right. just lick them right. all day long. On your young child. Kind of like in your <laughs> so mouth scary. on your teeth. How yeah. about on your lips too? Yeah. And and then put it on your t- your your you know, your five year old girls who have a dance recital. So I always with women it's like that's one of my yeah. first toxic questions what products are you using what makeup are you using um what body, what what are you slathering on your body what shampoos are you using right. because those are full of toxic perfumes things. all of that yeah yeah you have to be real it's really interesting how we you know we have this giant organ our skin and we you know it's a barrier and but we we depend way too much on it we think that things don't absorb when things absorb right through it Right. And they go right into our body. And we think, oh, it's just on my skin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's no, crazy. It's in your body. Yeah. It's in your liver. <laughs> it's everywhere. Okay. So those are the types that Dr. Bredesen talks about in his book. And I would concur that these are the usually the most common conditions we see with all kinds of Cognitive problems. decline, yeah. So for long-term brain health, these are the things that you want to be working on. And when I say working on... We do have a solution for this. Of course. And the the great thing about the book, and if you haven't already right now, gone to huntharvesthealth.com to our Amazon page, click on this book and go buy it. It's such a good read. It, it is, is a little heavy. It's a little heavy in the beginning. But and it's, it's really good. But you, you can get through it. I read Definitely. it in one night. So I was like <laughs> up all night reading this book. I did the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> Um, that shows how geeky I know. We are. <laughs> I actually went to the library this weekend with my daughter, and I got a novel. Nice, yeah, impressive. I was like I did get a one self help book and I or health book, and I got a novel, and I actually started reading the novel, that's and that's awesome. what I want to read. So here's the thing, folks: you do need stress reduction, definitely. Even people like us, if your brain is being pushed all the time, you're going to get stressed out and exhausted yep. and you're creating inflammatory and metabolic damage to your brain. So read the novel instead of the self-help book. You can just listen to this podcast and get all the Yeah, we'll read the self-help book and then we'll <laughs> tell you about it. Okay. Now, Dr. Bredesen, his research, he's been doing it for over 20 years and he has actually reversed um, subjective cognitive decline, which is from people who are subjectively coming in and they're saying, I have memory issues. I don't 
think I feel I, I'm not thinking as clearly, but they're not showing parameters that like would right. set them up for Alzheimer's, right? Right. The, the, their doctor would say, "Oh, that's old age." Right. And then there's mild cognitive decline, where they are actually markers that they can test where they're sure. seeing that the person. Um, and these are obviously things nobody ever wants to get diagnosed with, especially if you have to have a job or you want to get long-term health care, or there's a lot of factors to think into when it comes to cognitive decline. Of course. And especially with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, um, because it can be detrimental. Uh, he has case studies in the book about people not being able to get jobs, not being able to get health insurance, not being... So, you know, as providers, we do have to be careful. And I would say that... Um, it's pretty common to have mild cognitive decline, I would feel like. <laughs> well, even just stress can cause mild yeah, cognitive decline. The subjective cognitive decline. Just think about, like, m- I mean, jokes about mommy brain. And so, I mean, I know yeah. that goes farther than with a lot of, like, Your brain actually hormones does and they- shrink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I felt it. <laughs> but, yeah, it's like a lot of us experience that. So we think, uh-oh, we're just getting old. But it can be also detrimental getting a diagnosis like that if you still right. have to work and you have to pay your bills and, you know, you don't want to just roll over and die. You know, you want to live a full active life. Well, and you're probably not going to either. Yeah. <laughs> that's part of the that's part of the, the torture of all this. Yeah, you're not going to just roll over. It's going to take a long time. So what he proposed and what his research has shown through diagnosing people with these 36 markers. And the 36 markers are gonna cover the inflammatory processes. It's gonna cover the toxic elements and it's gonna cover uh, metabolic markers, right? Right, right, it's a great panel. A lot of these are panels that we can easily run in the office. Yeah. There is some imaging, if you were getting to that stage, you know, imaging of the brain that they can do. And there's some, a little, there's a few antibody tests that are a little bit more- Obscure. Obscure. But pretty much everything we can run in the office. And so he's he's taken these things, he's extracted it, he's used them on patients, and through research, he has, he has actually reversed cognitive decline and yeah. early stage Alzheimer's disease yep. without medication. And something that I think that's really important to throw in here is that the earlier you work on prevention and reversal, the more doable it is. And mm-hmm. he talks a lot about that in the book. And I feel like I've seen that in practice. He says 45. So what we're talking about here, we call it the cognoscopy. Mm-hmm. So everybody goes in like what, 50 is, cogno- is, is the colonoscopy, right? Yeah. You get your mammogram at 40. You mm-hmm. get your colonoscopy at 50. Prostate. Is it 50? 45. 45. Okay, so there's all these age ranges you're supposed to go get your your nethers checked down there. Yeah. But we don't think about the brain. And so yeah. he's saying 45, you should know all these things. You should have all these things run whether you have symptoms or not. Because, yeah, some of us will have those momentary memory things. But at 45, most of us are not going to be having mild cognitive decline. Yeah, agree. Or moderate cognitive decline. So... He's saying you should just have all these things run and you should know what your cognoscopy is so that you can continually work on these things. Agreed. So let's just go over a few of them. Yeah, because that sounds great. Because you can read about some of them in the book. We don't Sure. And it's something that both, um, well, really all of our doctors here, but definitely um, Dr. Lampers and myself um, offer here at Elevate Health. You know, you can come in and get this whole uh, cognoscopy other than the brain scans. We don't do that here in the clinic. Um, and this is also something if you pick up the book, you know, if you're not living here in Bozeman or you don't want a nice little vacation in Bozeman, um, (laughs) who wouldn't? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, you can take this to your doctor and talk with them about it. And, um, it has all the tests listed out and even the ranges that he recommends, which are optimal ranges, not necessarily normal ranges, which just means a a range that's going to be, um, closer to a more healthy status. Yeah. So actually, I think what we should do is let's just talk some about some of the big markers or the things that maybe are actually things people wouldn't think of. Okay, like, that what sounds are great. Some important things people wouldn't think of. Um, let's talk about homocysteine a little bit. Oh, homocysteine is a yeah. great one. Well, and that brings in some more genetics too, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 
go for it. Okay. Well, um, homocysteine. <laughs> it's the end of our day. I know. Like, uh. <laughs> so homocysteine is a compound that is made. Um, I'm going to do my best to not get to not geek out on biochemistry too much here, but it's part of the methylation um, cycle, which basically. Um, when, when your body is producing different chemicals and different neurotransmitters that it's using to just have normal function, it's doing a whole bunch of chemical processes. And one of the really important chemical processes that our body does is something called methylation. Don't really need to know much more about it than that. Um, but it involves a whole bunch of B vitamins and some great enzymes. And um, one enzyme that it does uh, kind of indirectly require or as part of the methylation cycle is the MTHFR. And, and, and this, you know, all of our enzymes are made because of the coding that's in our genetics. So there are certain genes that code for our MTHFR. And um, so that's why I said it, it brings in some other genetics because some people don't methylate very easily and not just because of MTHFR mutations. There's other things like COMT, but some people just can't methylate well. We talked to uh, Dr. Ben Lynch, so if you oh, want more perfect. information on, we talked about COMT, we talked about MTHFR, nice. uh, podcast episode 50. So I won't yeah. even delve any deeper because Dr. Lynch could talk circles around me, around all that stuff. Yeah. Um, but what I'll say is that if you're not doing a very good job making active folic acid, then you what can happen is homocysteine can get backed up because we need that active folic acid and B12 in order to use the homocysteine that's being produced in our body. So then we'll get elevated homocysteine and then homocysteine is inflammatory. Right. It's actually, you know, I think we learned about it back in school. We weren't even talking about MTHFR in school, but you know, right. we learned biochemistry, but it was, it was basically an, it was a early cardiovascular disease risk factor. So if you were having elevated homocysteine, you you could have early stage cardiovascular disease or heart attack. Right. And so um, that's pretty much all I learned in school too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so homocysteine again, easy to test in the blood. And if it's elevated or over seven, I think it is. Yeah. Like you you need to under we seven. need to work on that. You're having inflammation, and you may need again your genetics mm -hmm. tested to see if you're having problems with. Um, conversion. Yeah. And right? you may, you may be deficient in some B vitamins. Exactly. So B vitamins, magnesium, all those things so like important. for every single thing. If yep. you don't take, if you take two things every day, B vitamins, <laughs> magnesium, but you got to take the right B vitamins. It's true. That's it why knowing be, your genetics yep. can help. Yep. All right. Um, let's see. How about hormones? Everyone Ooh, on this podcast, we've talked one. about hormones, mainly testosterone a ton. We mm -hmm. talked to Dr. Jacqueline Chassie on oh, testosterone great. and she helped me do the testosterone project. But let's talk a little bit about the male and female hormones and how they're playing into sure. this. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, one thing that I think a lot of people maybe don't know is um, everybody makes progesterone. Mm -hmm. You know, both men and women have progesterone. We think of it more of as a female hormone because it does get a lot higher levels than females. Um, but it's very, very neuroprotective and, uh, well, anti-inflammatory to the nervous sp system specifically. So having, you know, low levels of progesterone um, can definitely lead to um, some problems within the nervous system, I think, mm -hmm. there. And um, I don't know, would you add more to progesterone? I mean, it's a great hormone. No, I, I mean, I really like, it's great for sleep. Yep. It's great for anxiety. Mm -hmm. Um you know, more so in women than men, just because we have more, more of it. Of course. Yeah. But as a neuroprotectant, yeah. And men are deficient in progesterone. It's, yeah. you know, well, we don't, we're seeing it in PTSD, PTSD being PTSD. a really helpful yep. support. So progesterone is definitely something that we want to look at. And then as well, you know, as the, all the hormones work together, you know, thinking about testosterone itself is what I see in patients who are having insulin resistance and blood sugar issues they tend to have low testosterone. Yeah, definitely. And you fix their testosterone and the other um, hormones that go along with that, and their insulin resistance starts to go down. Definitely. I see that a lot in the, diabe in the diabetics I treat. If we can't get their testosterone under control, we don't see their diabetes getting as under control mm -hmm. as we would like it to be. Um, so yeah, I think testosterone is incredibly critical. And then you just think about the roles that testosterone plays in building muscle and having stamina and those types of things. And if, if you're 
you know, building more fat and less muscle, you're, that also is setting up for those metabolic issues too. Yeah. And then estrogens, we could talk about estrogens for, I keep promising we're going to talk about estrogens. A lot. <laughs> estrogens are so complex, but, um, they can be good for you and they can be bad for you. Yep. So very inflammatory, uh, and anti-inflammatory. So those are the different types of estrogens and, um, you can, can be about that. Yeah. And vitamin D. Oh, vitamin D is so important. Vitamin D is a hormone. Yep. Right? Um, yep. We think of it as a vitamin, but really yep. it's a hormone. Yep. So knowing your vitamin D status and working on your vitamin D status and maintaining it, super important for your brain health. Yeah. And important for your immune system, which if you're fighting a lot of infection, that's going to be hard on your brain. And I think another thing that's really important to note is that if you're above a certain, if you're far, if you're a certain distance from the equator, um, well, I guess I should say, depending on the distance you are from the equator, there are times during the year that you do not, you could sit outside naked all day long in the sun and get absolutely no vitamin D conversion. Here in Montana, where we're located, uh, basically September to May, no vitamin D conversion. Mm. And so um, a lot of people will come in, they'll be like, I was skiing all day and I got tons of sun. And I'm like, you did get a burn. <laughs> you didn't get any vitamin D mm -hmm. um, just because we're not getting the right um, rays that do that conversion. So it's just really key to be on top of that. Yeah, very important. If you're in the north. Especially. And when I see people with good vitamin D, I'm like, whoa, what are you doing? So good. Okay. Um, those are just a few of the things. And like I said, I'm just going to put some on the website so people can download it. That sounds for the great. I love it. And, and that'll that give us great. a lot. So – I know we're running out of time here and I know it's late and it's snowing outside and icy and we both <laughs> have to drive home, but I'd like to, I ha I put a thing on Instagram today and I asked, I just had patients, people, not patients, but, uh, our community asked some questions. And so maybe we can just go over a few of those as it's related to brain health, um, that are more, I think something good for people to take away. Um, cause that's always the point of doing anything like this, right? is useful things that people can do. Yeah, I think that's day. a great idea. Okay. So um, one, one listener said, can we prevent Alzheimer's disease? And I think we've kind of proved that here is that I believe yes. Agreed. Um, I totally agree. I, but I believe it is, even though genetics will play a role in how and on whether or not you will affect it slightly, most of it is the choices you make. Yeah, I would yeah. agree. And I think it's just, you know, getting any sort of illness is complicated. You know, it's mm -hmm. not so simple as you just do this and that won't happen. It's more like there's all these things that you can do and you can likely um, tip the scales in that direction of not getting something. So, you know, you could do all these things and still get Alzheimer's, but you're going to greatly tip the scales in your favor of not getting it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk, let's start from the ground up. Let's talk about kids' brains. What are, somebody asked me about kids' brain health and how we, like, supplements or strategies for improving kids' brain health. Well, fish oils are really great for anybody's brain health because, you know, the majority of our cells are made out of um, lipids or fats, mm -hmm. and the brain is no um, exception, and it is even more kind of, fatty because of the myelin and those types of things or, or maybe that's the wrong way to say it it's not fatty <laughs> but it but it's being built with those building blocks which yeah, are really fat important. Is very important for the brain um and you know nerves. healthy eating really i mean i think that's the most important part and because you're not only keeping your child healthy by having them eat healthy you're you're teaching them what e eating healthy means just like that conversation you had with your daughter um you know, I, I've had so many friends growing up who, um, you know, just live on or lived on, grew up on, I mean, um, pizza and fish sticks and chicken tenders mm -hmm. and won't touch a vegetable. And by the time they're in their 20s, they have no taste for vegetables and they think they're gross. And that poor, that person has had a serious disservice mm -hmm. by not being forced to eat their broccoli, you know? I think, too, there's different stages. So I noticed with our older daughter, when she was little, she'd eat avocado, she'd eat everything. Sure. And then she had a stretch from, like, two to four where it was, like, good luck eating her, getting her to want to eat anything sure. besides, like, cheese quesadillas. Right. 
but now she's in a more cognitive stage where it's like you're gonna eat your broccoli and she goes okay and she eats it and she can comprehend right. why i'm having her eat it where my three-year-old will literally eat burritos all day long right bean burritos all day long that's all <laughs> she wants you know and i have to take into consideration that she doesn't really have the great taste buds for tons of vegetables yet she doesn't cognitively get what it means like right this is healthy for right, you right right she's still kind of in that hypnotic stage of her life where she's just kind of um uh Bless you. Somehow I missed it. <laughs> I, I was going to sneeze for all you at home. Had a big sneeze coming. I stepped away and then it, it went away. So I, f I do know it's a struggle for parents. And I know oh, it we is. get run down. Like, fine. Eat burritos all day for all I care. But well, you have to realize that as your child gets older, you need to be explaining to them. And you need to maybe have them working in a garden. And you need to have them... Um, understanding where food comes from. And this is Ryan and I's big thing. You know, we, we really feel that this emphasis will change society and the way we look at food is, is being closer to our food. Of course. And, you know, when my daughter went bear hunting with Ryan and, and when she, we grew a garden and, you know, she's seen it, she right. understands where her food comes from. Now, my three-year-old, she doesn't quite get that yet. Of course. But we will enforce in her as she gets older that these are the reasons. Well, so you have to pick your battles and yeah. you have to make sure your child's still eating food, you know. Yeah. So it is, there is. <laughs> yeah. Throw the candy away. <laughs> it will only drive you crazier. Um, and back to the fish oils, I think that's really important. So APOE4, they found that there's very specific types of omegas that APO4s right. need. And oh. one of them, I found the fish oils that work the best for an APOE4 is the triglyceride bound ones. They, they travel better across the membrane, and um, there's also some plant omegas. So um, any of the algaes and uh, things that are not necessarily like a straight fish oil, because remember, these things have to cross, right. and um, APOE4s have a harder time with that. Right. So uh, um, I can put a little bit more about that in the notes, but I think that uh, it's important it, Again, important to know your APOE status because that will help doctors like us be actually able to prescribe the right type of fish oil for you. So the Costco fish oil may be doing you absolutely no good if you have an APOE4. Well, it's pretty much all rancid too, so yeah. it's no good for you. Yeah. And the <laughs> other thing, last thing about APOE4, APOE4s do not do good with alcohol for good reason, right? You can't you can't get it out of your brain fast enough. Um, you can't detoxify it fast enough. So I find that people who have a hard time with alcohol, like they drink, you know, the, the folks that like drink one glass of wine or two glasses of wine, they feel absolutely horrible the next day. They have tons of cognitive issues, brain fog, blah, blah, blah. You, again, testing their genetics could be beneficial because they should not be drinking alcohol. Um, and so APOE2s, it's actually alcohol is actually somewhat protective and APO3s, you can clear alcohol faster. So again, even though that's a toxic substance, right? You don't want to go right. overboard. But I find that APOE4s have a harder time handling even a small amount of alcohol. So if you're like a lightweight, quote unquote, that may be a sign that maybe you have one or two of the APOE4s <laughs> and it's not good for your brain. It's just not worth it. It's right. not worth it to drink. Um, because you're damaging your brain. Um, okay. So enough about that. What about magnesium? Oh, magnesium's great. I love magnesium. Yeah. <laughs> I especially love magnesium because there's like 10 different types and they mm -hmm. all do different things. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that that's so cool to, you know, we need magnesium to relax our muscles and we need magnesium i mean it helps with brain clarity you know focus there's certain magnesiums mm -hmm. that are helpful for, for focus we can use it to regulate the bowels i mean magnesium is awesome i imagine you want me to talk about the nervous system and magnesium but i just could talk about magnesium <laughs> in so many different ways i love magnesium <laughs> Well, I think that i think it's just important to remember that biochemically magnesium is used for 
so many processes for right. conversion. It's a cofactor. If you're magnesium, again, and again, be vitamin deficient, you're going to have problems with energy metabolism, uh, muscle function, right. cardiac so function. Things. So really important. So I would say yes. I think magnesium threonate might be the best for the nervous system. I would say I'm pretty sure that is the best. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say that... Um, and there, again, like if you need it for your gut, there's different forms of magnesium. Yep. But magnesium 3 and 8 would be the best one for your nervous system. Okay. Uh, okay, we got two big ones here, which we could talk to entire podcast on. <laughs> uh, one is managing stress. Oh, gosh. Probably the most important thing on the list. Because, you know, we live in such a crazy world and even just people's normal. I mean, just think about the average American. They're working a job. They have several kids. They want to exercise. They want to cook dinner for their family. You know, like the list of just, I mean, just that right there, I'm exhausted just Mm -hmm. thinking of like, okay, so you got to get the kids to school. You got to get yourself to work. You got to do your job. Hopefully you ate lunch. You got to get home. You got to pick up the kids first, (laughs) then get home, then make dinner. I mean, it's like, that's an average life. That's, that's just basic. Like forget about doing anything in addition. So many people work way more than 40 hours. So many people never get vacation. I mean, lots of people work the weekends. Lots of people work more than one job. I mean, it's just stress is a, is a big deal. I, and that's not even talking about like you have a poor relationship with your in-laws or you have a stressful um, marriage yep, or a child that's ill illness. or, I mean, we could come up with a million and one things that add to that stress. And, um, that stress causes chemical changes in your body, which leads to irritation and inflammation. And it is critical to balance that. Yeah. Cortisol, you need cortisol, but it's damaging. Yeah, it's very damaging. damaging. And uh, I'm a, you know, everybody on this podcast knows I'm a bit of a stressy person. I'm a more high stress, adrenaline driven. Um, I'm one of those, I'll work all day and not eat and, you know, uh, get stressed out about little things that I shouldn't or whatever. And I know my genetics. So I know a lot, a lot about how the different genetics I have plays into it. But I also know that if I'm not moving, if I'm not burning those stress hormones off with exercise, uh, I feel lousy. I know if right. I'm not um, getting downtime and not having the hamster wheel brain all the time, it over time is, is very debilitating to me. And, you know, Ryan is good at that. He just, I've always wondered how he does it. He just leaves his job and he goes into the backcountry and he's just in the backcountry. And I've taken trips with him before and he just he just switches off. I know. Devin's the same way. I don't know. <laughs> and I'm okay. more like you where I'm like my brain is like going like a hamster wheel all the time. And I think part of it is that we are women. And I would just say this to all the ladies out there. And I've probably said this before, but we just have a bigger corpus callosum. So both sides of our brain talk to each other very well. Thus, we can multitask very well. But I think what that also does is that stimulates us to have a million thoughts a day about mm-hmm. all the things that we need to do or that we haven't done or that we mm-hmm. should have done or ruminate about, I don't know, the boyfriend that dumped you 20 years ago. You know, mm-hmm. it, it, it can be a bit of a hindrance to us. And then pro- probably estrogen plays into it some too. But um, I think it is a little easier for guys to turn off Mm -hmm. if you're full of cortisol however like some big ceo with a high stress you you may not be able to turn off so you're not the guy that can just go into the back country and turn off (laughs) yeah yeah but um i think it's more common in women just because we we do multitask a lot more well and i think Um, that brings up a really i mean your audience this is going to be like the most obvious thing to all of them i'm sure but just getting into nature, like that really balances. There's all these studies coming out now and all these different um, approaches where they're putting people in like these glass houses to help calm their stress and anxiety. And, you know, whether it's getting out into the back country or going on a hike or just going to your local park, whatever you have access to, you know, being around trees and grass and flowers and birds and all of that is so key, I think, in I mean, it's really good to Mm -hmm. bring those cortisol levels down and balance out those stress hormones. 
Yeah, I mean, it takes a while, right? But who doesn't feel better after a couple of days of camping? Yeah. Or just being outside and doing something. Right, Or just right. skiing for a day. Yeah. It's so, crazy. So important. Yeah. So managing stress is very important. And then the last thing we're going to talk about here is sleep. Oh, so important. Because I think managing stress and sleep piggyback with each other. Sure. Um, people don't sleep well and they don't sleep or enough. enough. Yeah. And again, that's just the process of life. I think with children and I don't know, my dog just had puppies <laughs> and I, my kids sleep great now and these puppies howl all night long. So I'm like, what? <laughs> but it's a struggle. Yeah. And sleep is a talking about turning your brain off. Right. Like going to the back country. Like most people cannot turn their brains off just to fall asleep and stay asleep. Well, we have so many stimulants. I mean, people yeah. go to sleep watching TV or playing on their phone or. Who hasn't binge watched Netflix yeah. series till one in the morning? Sure. Guilty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but. It, it is detrimental, and I will say that the exposure to technology and the, the blue lights and constantly being hyper-stimulated yeah. is, a, is definitely affecting the circadian rhythm. It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, melatonin gets suppressed if you're being um, exposed to those blue lights, and so... Um, it, we And we have light all the time, mm -hmm. and so that's a huge thing. Also... I feel like people don't take sleep seriously enough, so they stay up way too late. They don't go to bed on time. They wake up early because they have to get to work, and sleep is when our body's repairing all of its tissues. And, and So one very important thing about sleep, which you just said, and if, if we go into a little bit of anatomy and physiology here, is that you have a system in your brain called the glymphatic system and they've just discovered this in like the last decade or so and it's a separate lymphatic system that is basically pulling the crud out of your brain and it's pulling it into your central uh, lymphatic system and then you're getting rid of it right so you have a lymphatic system all your lymph nodes and all that stuff that just is constantly taking waste out of your body well, the brain has its own separate glymphatic system. So if we even just talk about what APOE4 does, you know, carrying fat molecules right. in the brain, and now on top of it, the only time the glymphatic system works fully is when you're sleeping. And that's deep sleep. Right. I mean, I've had people tell me they've monitored their sleep. They get like six minutes of deep sleep wow right and the goal would be okay let's get you up to 30 or right and their life changes like dramatically changes right but um that glymphatic system cannot detoxify your brain if you're not sleeping right right and again thinking about physiology as i mean <laughs> listen to a friend of ours uh, mike mutzel we've been on his podcast high intensity health and he interviewed the guy um, who created the Aura Ring. Oh, yeah. yeah. I want one of those. I do, too. <laughs> if only they weren't several hundred dollars. <laughs> they have really nice ones now. They used to I just know. Have these They're big, so gaudy cool. Things. So, yeah, check out the Aura Ring um, and Mike's podcast. He talks to the creator of that. And he basically said sleep is like if it was a supplement, it, it would be the top selling supplement in the world. Like meaning it has so many profound good effects for your body that it is like, it's the best testosterone booster. It's the best stress reducer. It's the best. Right. This, and we just don't put enough emphasis, emphasis no, on it. And really then we create don't. all these things that just make it even harder to sleep. So, so it's true. like the drug you need. It's like the number one drug you need and you can't get enough of it because you're blocking it. Right. By all the right. things. So I'm a big proponent of the sleep because I've never been a big sleeper. Mm. And I know how that can affect you. And that's part of the reason I would call myself a more stressed out person. Yeah. When I get sleep, it's transformative. Yeah. Right. So, um, yes, all you ladies out there who don't sleep all night and you men, you will again someday, I promise. And your brain will work better. <laughs> <laughs> but it's important. Okay, um, we got a question about brain injury, but I just feel like that is so such a big question. So huge. Yeah, and we could do a whole podcast just on helping so brain injury, and maybe we'll do that. Yeah. Um, if you want to, we'll see what people's feedback is. Yeah, from this. if people are interested, that's another big passion of mine because I 
just have seen some really sad things happen where people have had brain injuries and not been treated pr- appropriately and then mm-hmm. a lot of damage can happen. I agree. Yeah, it's one of my bigger bigger um, interests as well. So any parting words here? Well, I would just say we just talked about a lot of complicated stuff and it could seem really overwhelming, but if you want to protect your brain and protect your uh, longevity and cognition for the long, long term, I, you know, my best advice would be, um, well, of course, get this cognoscopy. I think it's a great thing to do and can really get you ahead of the curve and help you, you know, get some help in learning how to protect things. But if you're like, well, but what do I do by myself without buying a mm-hmm. book or going to see a doctor or doing something? Work on getting enough sleep. Work on eating lots of vegetables and clean, you know, healthy meats. And if you do meats and um, whole grains, if you do grains, clean water. Uh, have good relationships, Mm -hmm. you know, get stress management, you know, relax, (laughs) Yeah. do do things that give you joy and relax, breathe clean air, get outside. It's basics, you know, just do the basics Mm -hmm. and you will be amazed at how much that, where that gets you. This is why when I read that book, I finished that book after reading it that whole night, not sleeping, which I shouldn't (laughs) be saying that. I thought to myself, this is what I've been telling my patients to do for forever. Right, right. This is this is finally in medical research is showing that what we have to offer to patients um, and what MDs are now learning and they're they're hungry for. They right. want to find right. a way to help their patients besides just giving them a medication. Right. That's not right. gonna work and it's not right. gonna stop it. It's not telling people, well, sorry this is your life. Right. I mean, they're hungry for this. And I just remember feeling really empowered. Mm -hmm. Like this is something that I can help people do that I can do for myself. Right. And I don't have to be like a victim to my genes. My patients don't have to feel like a victim to their genes. And it's just such useful information to help you make better choices. But you're right. The basics are everything. Yeah. And you, you know, know what? The All the rest of this, you know, this book has some great supplements to do and yeah. all these things. None of that works without the basics. No. No. You know, you have to. I was just at a conference a couple of months ago uh, where some of my mentors were speaking, and that was one of the main things that was presented. And I remember just being like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Not that I don't do that every day with my patients, but it's easy to forget. All that other stuff is is just the, you know, the other little pieces that you can do. And this is why I wanted to share this with our with our listeners because we can get wrapped up in the science. Yeah. Oh, we definitely. can get wrapped up in in and think that we we don't understand this. Like the layperson like, I don't understand this. You know, these smart right. people know this stuff and these scientists know this stuff, but what do I actually do? Right. And we can get wrapped up in the science and we want to learn all these new scientific things and you're right. I can't tell you how many conferences I've gone to. And it's like, okay, here's all the science. Here's all this fancy stuff. And then the end the treatment plan is like, go outside, you know, like get some fresh air, right. eat clean food. It's, it's just move, move. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's just how it is. You can't, yeah. you can't get around it. Right. So, um, I think so we right. like to kind of separate ourselves from the natural world and think that we're different than, um, I don't know, the deer and the birds and the bears, and we are no different. Mm -hmm. We just can choose to do different things, (laughs) but we need all the same things that any other living creature needs, and we're not healthy unless we have those things. Yep, exactly. Beautiful parting words. (laughs) Thanks. Okay, thanks, Bronwyn. Oh, thanks so much for having me on. This was really fun. um, I'll have Dr. Bronwyn's information as well as the clinic Elevate Health on there. If you want more guidance with any of these things we talked about, let us know. All right. Thank you. The Stealthy Hunter Hunt Harvest Health website and podcast is for general health information only. This podcast is not to be used as a substitute for medical advice, 
diagnosis or treatment of any health condition or problem. Dr. Hilary Lampers, Ryan Lampers, and the Stealthy Hunter Hunt Harvest Health brand does not diagnose, prescribe, or replace the services of a health professional. Any questions regarding your own health should be addressed to your own primary care physician or other health care provider.